Good evening. Good evening. You need your Bibles. Yeah. Get them out. We're going to put them to work tonight. Now, the very first thing you got to remember that you just heard is that I get to preach until midnight. <laughs> <laughs> the only problem is if any of you fall out the window, you're on your own. Because <laughs> I'm not sure I can raise you from the dead. That's right. <laughs> Appreciate the, the invitation. It's, it's been a few years since I've been able to get together with brethren here. I, I've enjoyed the last year being, uh, especially the last year, uh, being in and out of hospital and having back surgery. You got nothing on me. <laughs> My scar is bigger than yours. <laughs> but it is always a treasure, a blessing to be together with, with you. So, so much fun to see so many that have. I don't know about some of these young people. They're supposed to be about this high. Yeah. yeah. What have y'all been feeding them? Yeah. <laughs> I trust that you paid attention to those first two lessons. Because otherwise I am going to have to preach till midnight. <laughs> if you slept through those. Because they're really the basis of, of where we're going. You'll notice I don't I don't have a bunch of slides here. We're, we're going to look at the scriptures. I'll be honest with you and tell you why. I've worked with computers since the years that I uh, first met you. Uh, I was I a was, uh, manager for a consulting firm in Tucson when your preacher first uh, uh, got started here. My dad was an elder. And I'll be real honest with you, I, I know and understand those computers. But in the end, if you do not know and understand God's word, yeah. you're failing. Yeah, that's right. Now I use that term pretty quickly. Taught in the school of preaching for about 12 years. I've taught young men to become preachers. I've taught preachers that have been preachers for years and be better preachers. And I'm not afraid to, to tell somebody that that's not right. In fact, my wife, she, Lou works a, a great school there in, in uh, Casa Grande. And, she comes home and she tells me the kids misbehave and, and they do this and that and, and they have to pass them anyway and they can't read and they can't write. And I keep saying, said, tell them to hire me. Because <laughs> that will get cured in about one week. May have a lot less students, but they're going to sit up, they're going to study, and they're going to do right. Amen. Amen. But you know, that's the way we're, as Christians, supposed to be. Grown up. But you're yes, right. Stop being babies. In fact, the, the theme of, of this study, uh, be not unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Now, you remember that word, unwise, because we're going to come back to it in just a minute. First passage we're going to look at is in Ephesians 5. So you just go ahead and turn your Bibles to Ephesians 5. And let me remind you of a couple of things that our brothers just already told us. How many ways are there that are right before God? Just one. It's not my way. It's not your way. It's the Lord's way. That's right. Preach it. And anything else that you come up with is the wrong way. That's right. Now we understand that, or should be able to understand that pretty well. You hop out here on the road, and and it says it's a one-way street. And I tried to explain to that police officer, I was just going one way. <laughs> and he didn't buy it at all. 
Why? Because it was the wrong way. But God says there's a right way. That was the whole point of, of that first lesson. There is a one-way, right way. Amen. That's right. And the only way we know that is by knowing God's Word. Amen. Now see there? That's why I get all this extra time. Because I just summed up there two lessons. <laughs> but you understand and appreciate the point that God is making in his word now let me be honest with you I told you I'm going to make you work tonight and look up some scriptures Amen. and I'll be honest very honest with you as a young preacher I sat in the pew and heard an older gentleman get up and preach one time and he announced to the congregation, he says, I'm going to use a lot of scriptures. You don't have time to turn to them. Don't you waste time turning to them. Your Bible reads just like mine. I will tell you what it says. Don't you ever listen to a preacher that says that. Because you may recall there in the book of Acts, that the church of Berea did just the opposite. Right. Right. They refused to just listen to what the Apostle Paul, yeah. that's my middle name. <laughs> you should listen to what Lester Paul has to say. <laughs> you shouldn't need to check your Bible on it. Don't listen to him if that's what he tells you. Yeah. Turn to God's Word. We begin in Ephesians 5, verses 11 to 17. Do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them. You know, in a lot of years of preaching, I've been criticized more than once. You shouldn't talk about people that way. Just because they're preaching there, that it's okay. No, it's not okay. That's right. God says it's wrong. Right. Don't tolerate it. If I don't preach the truth out of God's word, get up and leave. Amen. One of us doesn't belong here. Or maybe get up and ask me to leave. But you understand that point that the Apostle Paul was making. For it is a disgraceful thing even to speak of the things that are done by them in secret. But all things become visible when they are exposed by the light. Everything that becomes visible is light. For this reason it says, and what Paul is quoting here in verse 14, most scholars think that, that this is a song used by the first century church. There. Was Paul the author of it? I don't know. Wish I knew. Wish I knew. Wish he had given the rest of the words to that. Wouldn't it be great, Alan, to lead that song? Brother, that, that would be an amazing song. Mm -hmm. For that reason, it says, Awake, sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Therefore, be careful how you walk. Not as New American Standard here says uh, unwise yeah. men, but as wise. The Greek is a little more blunt there. It's a word that in Greek means a fool. And not just any old fool, but a fool that is, is literally so egregiously wrong so evidently wrong to everyone you know there are a lot of things we see out in the world that people are condoning and, yeah. and uh, trying to tell us is alright today yeah. mm -hmm. and if you pay attention you immediately think that, that, that's wrong and that's the kind of word to call not just unwrong not, not just something that, that's, that's unright, something that's wrong, but something that's foolishly wrong. Yeah. 
Oh, Jesus said don't use the word fool. Actually, it's a different word, but it means the same thing in Greek. <laughs> Paul says they're fools. Make the most of your time because the days are evil. So then, do not be foolish. Whoops. That's twice he says, don't be foolish. Don't be unwise. Don't be foolish. Do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Turn to 2 Peter, chapter 1. 2 Peter, chapter 1, verse 16. By the way, if you can't find some of these books that are a little small and hard to find, and you have to sit there and sing, Alan, could you leave the, the song? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Acts and Luke. I've had students, preaching students, first year preaching students, that in order to pass their course to continue studying to be preachers, they had to list every book in the Bible. And I would tell them, if you can't do it any other way than by sitting there singing that song, then do it. But you've got to learn where they are. So if I catch anybody ever singing, my wife will help you. Matthew, Mark, Luke, you know where they are. Whatever it takes, you need to know God's work. Yeah. Never be ashamed of whatever effort it takes to know God's work. And if a bunch of young preachers that are learning to preach are going to sit there and pass an exam by singing that song, then we can look a little silly sometimes too. Because it means we're learning God's work. That's right. Second Peter chapter 1. Peter begins this, this second letter. Remind you that God has given all things that pertain to his will for us. We've got it all. Now, we've really heard all of this tonight already, but here's how Peter tells it. Simon Peter, a slave. Our world says that's an ugly word. Brethren, we need to get used to being slaves. Amen. Slaves of Jesus Christ. That's right. Because if you're not a slave to Jesus Christ, you're a slave to Satan and Satan. Amen. Amen. Choose your master. That's right. And that's exactly what Jesus said, isn't it? That's right. Choose your master. Simon Peter, a slave, an apostle of Jesus Christ to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours. <clears throat> By the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Two things you need to notice there. Number one, I'm going I, I, I love passages like this that point the finger at us, don't you? He's not saying this is, and, and the point was already made by the brother. These letters are not written about the Apostle Paul or by Peter to just the elders or or to a select group of people. These are written to Christians, to us. That's right. Yeah. Peter just said, hey guys, pay attention. This is for you. Second thing is, by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. Again, that's one of those passages I love how it reads in the Greek because it's all one phrase. Our God and our Savior are Jesus Christ. Do you realize, do you understand who Jesus Christ is? We have people in the world, we have denominations that are busy trying to teach, oh, he's a created being, he became the Son of God, he's kind of like us, just kind of adopted, a second, uh, you know, a red-headed stepchild. Doesn't really belong. And the reality is that Jesus, I, I, I love arguing with, with some of uh, uh, the supposed great minds. Any, how many of you own a commentary? Yeah. Do you know why you own a commentary? To argue with them. 
<laughs> if you own a commentary to let them tell you what to believe and what the Bible says, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> you only read a commentary after you've read the scripture and understand what it means to see if there's either some more you can learn. Amen. Or if there is a false teaching that people glom on to and like to spread because of that. One of the popular things in commentaries, especially the last 40 years or so, has been the idea that, that uh, you know, Jesus never really believed himself to be God at all. Yeah. Have you read the Gospel of John? Yeah. Read. Right. And there's some surprising things in it when you do a little bit of digging in there. Jesus will say, before Abraham was... I am. That's right. Why? Why did he say that? Go back and read Moses at the burning bush in Exodus there. That's right. When he asked God, when I go and tell the people in Egypt that, that God has sent me, and they ask me, what God? Who are you? Who do I tell them? And God says, tell them I am sent you. The beauty of that phrase, if you do a little digging, the Hebrew word is literally, we, we get used to tenses. My wife is going to beat me when I get home. That's future tense. My wife beat me yesterday. I hope y'all will be nice to me so she doesn't beat me tonight. That's present tense. The term that God uses in the Hebrew is actually past, present, and future tense all rolled into one. Yeah. It literally becomes, if you were going to translate it properly, I am the God that always was, am now, and always will be. And Hebrew just ties it all up in one little word. Yeah, it's one little word. By the way, the Jewish people talk about the Ten Commandments. You know what they call them? The Ten Words. The Ten Commandments are summed up in one Hebrew word each. Kind of amazing thing. We, we, we get, uh, you know, our Bibles out and we get uh, a picture. I, I've seen a picture of, of the stone tablets that Moses brought down. Haven't you seen it in your Bible? <laughs> and it has all the writing out there of God. And the reality is that in Hebrew it only takes ten words. Because that's literally what the Ten Commandments are known as in Hebrew. The ten words. God says a lot in those ten words. Right. It takes a whole lot of English words to explain what he means. Just like I am. And Jesus would use that phrase I am over and over and over again. Let me tell you one. We got... I'm going to take an extra 35 seconds. Keep an eye on that clock. <laughs> I got you, brother. Okay. When Jesus and John's gospel goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, he prays. As he starts to leave, as he finishes his prayer, Judas and the others come to arrest him. And they ask the question, are you the Christ? Are you the one that we're looking for? Are you Jesus? And Jesus' answer in the Greek is very concise. All Jesus says is, and I wonder how it sounded that night, because you go back and read John's Gospel. When Jesus speaks, every man, the soldiers, the men, the right. priests, all fall down on their knees before him. Yes. And all he says is, I am. I know your English Bible will say, I am the one, or I'm the one you're looking for, or I'm this, that, or the other. But in the words that Jesus, according to the gospel writer, actually said, the only thing he said is, I am. About you, but that sends chills down my yeah, back. That's right. That. Yes. No wonder they fell on their face. And no wonder they were embarrassed that the man they were arresting they had just acknowledged as the I am. The 
the righteousness of our God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Understand who God really is, who Jesus really is. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of this second time. In verse 2, he splits them. Both God and of Jesus our Lord. Seeing that his divine power has granted to us. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Your Bibles don't read right. <laughs> God has granted to us through his divine power some of the things, but the preacher's going to tell you the really important things. Isn't that right, brothers? That's what we're here for. No. Peter says his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. How? Through the true knowledge of Lester Bagley. <laughs> of some handsome preacher. I don't brother, I don't know how you can get preachers that have fuzzy stuff on top of their heads. <laughs> They're not near as pretty as some of us. <laughs> you understand the point. The true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. And the word excellence there is just the opposite of that foolishness that Paul used earlier. It's literally moral excellence. That term is used of God several times by the New Testament writers. God has morality. That's something our world doesn't know anything about. Right? And our God is the very definition of moral excellence. For by these things he has granted to us his <coughs> precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature. Did you listen to those first two lessons? Mm -hmm. We don't die like the world does. Right. No. In fact, the term that's used for for God's people several times by the Apostle Paul is sleep. He says it's, it's not the same thing as what the world faces. This is not the end. This is the beginning. There's nothing to be worried about. By these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world by loss. Brothers and sisters, we have, in God's Word, everything we need from God. That's right. Yeah. That's, it. That's it. If we take the time and the effort to use it. Yes. Yeah. Challenge for us is to learn how to use it properly. Second Peter, First chapter, verse 5. Now, for this very reason, apply all diligence. Right. Diligence is a word we want to scratch out of our Bible. It means hard work. That's right. It's the same word the Apostle Paul uses, brother already quoted. Study to show yourself approved to God. It's literally the same word. Diligent, hard work. I don't know about you, but I love hard work. I could work, watch it for hours. All day. But Paul and Peter both tell us, guys, do it. Work hard. Study. In your faith, supply moral excellence. If the very definition of God is morality and moral excellence, yep. he says, be imitators of God. Yes. Paul would brag, be imitators of me as I imitate Christ. Yes. And in your moral excellence, knowledge. Brother already said it. You've got to keep studying God's word. And I don't care how many times you. One of the amazing things to me 
I, maybe I'm just a lot dumber and a lot slower than the rest of y'all. But every time I go over a passage in God's Word, something new jumps out. Wow! Not new in the sense of, I'm going to jump up, and by the way, never trust a preacher that jumps up and says, hey, I'm going to tell you guys something that you never knew. Nobody else ever knew this. Since the first century, everybody's gotten it wrong but me. <laughs> Don't trust people like that any further than you can throw them. But I guarantee you that if you keep studying and digging into God's Word, you will learn something new every single time. That's right, man. It's always fresh. Yes. I've got some books that over the years I've read and reread and reread, and, and mostly because, I don't know about you, but my rememberer is broken now. <laughs> but my forgetter works perfect. <laughs> and I reread those things, and I think, ah, oh, yeah, I'd forgotten that I knew that. In your moral excellence and knowledge. Keep studying. Keep studying. In your knowledge, self-control. Mm -hmm. Self-control, perseverance. Mm -hmm. After that back surgery, I learned something. I'm never going to get out and run. I used to do miles and miles and running and thought that was really neat. Yeah, yeah don't do that anymore. <laughs> no. <laughs> But you know how you get to where you can run? And run further? It's more of that hard work thing, isn't it? You've got to get out there, you've got to sweat, you've got to get until you're out of breath, and, and can't possibly go anymore, and then go a little bit more, and then the next time you've got to do even more than that. That's right. And that's exactly the word. Come on, bro. Apostle Paul... I don't know if you remember this or not, but the Apostle Paul loved sports. Yeah. I've often thought that it's a good thing that the Apostle Paul did not live in our 21st century. <laughs> he would be there with those brethren who skip church on Super Bowl Sunday. <laughs> Man, I gotta see him. I gotta watch who's playing. And if you don't appreciate or understand that, go back and read Paul's letters. See how many times he talks about the different sports. And yeah. I won't box without aim. I won't do this. I won't do that. I will run with purpose. He saw it and he knew the effort that it took to be a prize athlete. Mm -hmm. Yes. And your perseverance at godliness. Mm -hmm. It's hard now. Your godliness and brotherly kindness. I have to like my brothers and sisters. <laughs> do you realize? Do you realize how rotten some Christians are? Some of my brothers and sisters are. God says I have to be nice to them. And brotherly kindness. And this time he uses the word agape. It should never be translated as love. English doesn't have the, the required understanding. That's right. Literally, every time you see the word love and it comes from agape, think commitment. God loved us while we were yet sinners and gave Christ to die for us. That's right. That does not mean he liked us. <laughs> he hated us in our sin. He hated everything that we were and we represented. And hated us so much that he would happily condemn us to hell. But he was committed to us. That's right. Come on, bro. And don't you thank the Lord that he was. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> it's interesting that the Apostle Paul tells you to husbands agape your wives. You don't have to like your wife. You have to love her. Be committed to her. That's harder. 
And just ask my wife if it's, if it's not harder to do that for your husband. <laughs> Him? That sorry outfit? <laughs> and yet that's the level of commitment God demands. If these are yours and increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Be like Jesus. Amen. To know how. 2 Timothy 2 15. Already looked at. Study. Work hard. That's right. Work hard. One other scripture that uh, the brothers here had suggested to go with this lesson 1 Corinthians 14 37 38. Anyone thinks he's a prophet or spiritual, let him recognize that the things which I write to you are the Lord's commandment. Yes. If you really think you know what you're talking about, recognize the truth of God's word. <coughs> Don't you hate that he included verse 36 in there? <laughs> but if anyone does not recognize this, he does not recognize. That's right. There are no alternatives. Nope. There are no other options but for us to live that Christ-like life. Yes. And do it right, God's way. That's right. Matthew 28, 19, 20, the Great Commission. That's our charge. Yes. One last passage. Turn to uh, 1 Peter 2 as we close tonight. God has given us everything we need. And he has given us a job to do. Did you ever ask your children? You give them an order. Tell them to clean up the room. Did you do what I told you to? You know, surprisingly, you walk in your child's room and everything, all the toys are still scattered over the floor. The bed's not made. Everything's pulled down from the walls. All the clothes are pulled out and laying on the bed. And, and your child will stand there with a straight face and say, Yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> and do you as a parent believe that? No, we give them a lecture. Kids, I hate to tell you this, but all parents have gone to a special school and memorized all these words and lectures that they tell their children. They all say the same thing. It doesn't help if you trade parents. <laughs> you can never get a decent parent. We have a job to do. And a command from God to do it. But there's just a little bit more to that. 1 Peter 2, verse 9. When you do it and do it right, Peter says you are a chosen person family. The biggest agreement I've had for years with some translators. number of translations use the word race there. It's not the word for race. It is literally the Greek word for family. It's a closer relationship. It's all the people that are related to me. I took one of those fancy uh, DNA tests a few years ago. I have a niece that, that just got excited. She, she took it. She says, I want to be something different. And she found out she's all the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> just what she thought she was. She's not related to much of anybody. I don't know what to say about her. Mine came back and it says, you're more like Heinz 57 than anything else. Now, any of y'all that laugh at that means you're old. <laughs> it used to be a commercial. Heinz 57 varieties, all the different, everything, all rolled into one. That's right. Yeah. Well, I guess I am related to everybody. But you know, we all are anyway. We all, that's right. <laughs> So I don't, I don't really care for that, that English word uh, that's used in a lot of translations there because the Greek word is literally family. It's those related by blood. You are a chosen family. That's God's people. What's more, you're a royal priesthood. A holy nation. 
people for God's own possession. Now it seems like everybody I've ever met has the first half of that verse 9 underlined. You underline the last half. Because Peter says the same thing as Jesus did in the Great Commission. Yep. The reason that you are called and blessed that way by God is so that you can share the good news That's of Jesus. Right. That's right. Every brother here tonight is reminded us we need to study it, we need to know it. It's the truth, it's the only truth, the only way to go. But your job is to know it and share it. That's right. If you stop with knowing it, with all the knowledge, I already said that too. I told you these two stole my lesson. Yeah. <laughs> if you know everything there is to know in this book and do not share it, you're a thief. Yes. You're a thief. You've stolen the way of salvation, the hope of eternity. Amen. from everyone else in the world. By tradition, we end with an invitation when we gather together. It's a tradition. You know, there are some good traditions. Sometimes we have two or three prayers. Is that a good tradition? Sure. Sometimes we, we sing more than one verse. Raised in the South, my parents are Southerners, Alabama. Just like the Apostle Paul. No, sir. War Eagle. Whoa. You go wash your mouth, that was so funny. You know, the beauty of, of, of being a part of God's family is the understanding. Not only of how privileged and blessed we are, but how much of a blessing we have to give to the rest That's of the world. That's right, brother. Amen. Amen. You need to that answer that invitation of the Lord tonight. You're ready to be baptized to put your Lord on baptism to have your sins washed away. Scripture describes that in so many wonderful ways. Read the sixth chapter of Romans. And understand the precious promises of God. But it does not stop there. No. And if you don't spend every day for the rest of your life in God's Word, learning it and sharing it, you're failing the Lord. Amen. That's pretty harsh, isn't it? I mean, there's. Do you realize how many important things there are to do every single day? More important? <clears throat> oh, I guess not. Wouldn't it be hard to die on one of those days where you were doing something more important than spending time with the Lord? Don't let that pass, even if you're a child of God. Make sure you're right with Him and Amen. living with Him tonight and always. Amen. That's His invitation as we stand and say.